Burnt Out. Welcome to Burnt Out. The Burnt Out Podcast shares the stories of firefighters, emergency personnel, and other first responders around the world to create a pathway to save lives. The stories you will hear are real and may be disturbing to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. And now I'd like to introduce you to your host for Burnt Out, a 33-year retired veteran of the fire department, Skip O. Sean, thank you for that introduction. I'd like to welcome everybody to Burnout Podcast. We are here with uh, some good guests and a good guest host. And uh, But first, I would like to thank our sponsors. I'd like to thank Recovery First, Turning Point Madison County, and Bridges of Hope, the Warriors Program. You can go to our website, burnoutpodcast.org, and you can find more information about our sponsors. We could not be doing this if they didn't come on board with us and help pay our bills for us. But... Again, thanks everybody for coming on. Uh, Jeff, our guest host, the old guy. Good, that's me. Good day. How you doing, Skip? I'm doing good this morning. A little cold. I'm whining a little bit, but uh, I'm doing okay. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Well, we got connected uh, with our next guest through Jeff, and uh, and her name's April. She's from Tennessee. April, welcome to the show today. Thank you, Skip. I'm grateful to be here. Thanks for asking me to be a part of this. No problem. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Good. Hey, could you give a brief description of you just so people can get to know you, and then we'll go in and lead into the questions and your story? Sure. Uh, my name is April Colors. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. About to be 45 years old. I have two daughters, uh, 14 and 25. I've been married and divorced. I joined the Memphis Fire Department when I was 23 years old and spent 18 years as a firefighter paramedic. Um, and I am now a paramedic at a private service and looking to do a bridge program to get my RN this year. That's awesome. I tell you, it's uh, the, from, from what you went through for, you know, just a little, knowing a little bit about you to now, it's a, you're a miracle. Um, yeah. Yeah. I agree. You know, let's go back in time a little bit. You know, when you were, uh, before you as a firefighter, paramedic and stuff and, uh, before that, what, did you always have in your mind or heart that was that a dream of yours <laughs> to be a firefighter paramedic? Absolutely not. It was not a childhood dream. Um, thought I was going to be a nurse, but um, the situation I was in, it led me to EMT school and I loved it and went to paramedic school and tried out for the fire department. And it was like that, that it, it became a dream then. So when you decided, when you first found out you wanted to be a fireman or a paramedic, uh, what took, what led you to that occupation? Yeah, I just remember the war stories they used to talk about in EMT school. And I was like, wow, that just sounds great. And I couldn't wait to do it. And I had so many people tell me when I was wanting to join the fire department, tell me that I can't make it. I'm five foot. It was 130 pounds. Uh, you'll never make it. And, and I did. <laughs> okay. When you got into, when you got into fire school or, and, uh, kind of describe that for, for you as a woman. Oh, wow. So man, that, that first week is so exciting. I remember when we did our first, um, first little burn and stuff. Uh, we went in and I just thought that was so awesome. Uh, I knew that was my calling at that point. Um, spent five months in the fire academy and yeah. I, I knew it was right up my alley. I'm an adventurous person, and fighting fire was awesome. You got on the fire department, and you started uh, MT. When did you get in medic school? I was in medic school before I got on the fire department. I was going through medic school when I was 20, and that's when I tried out for the fire department. Um, and I got hired on at 23, right after 9-11. So that was even more exciting. Uh, my class started two months after 9-11. Did uh, 9-11 have any inspiration to you and join the fire service? I, I was already I was already hired when 9-11 happened. My class started in November that year. Okay. But yeah, it did. And uh, yeah, I really looked forward to it. So you was already a paramedic. You were going through your fire training. And uh, did you uh, go on an engine company or the medic right away? I did both. Um, so we worked 24 hour shifts and I did 12 hours on the ambulance and 12 hours on the fire engine. Kind of like that. 
Yeah, it was, yeah, it was great. <laughs> I mean, if you got it, if you got it, you got it, right? I mean, twelve exactly. hours at a time. I'd, I'd rather be on the engine twenty four, but still, if you got to yeah, do the ambulance. Yeah, uh, I was so I was so gung ho. I worked a ton of overtime. I, I just loved it. I loved it. So, in your mind, you know, like I was telling some people earlier, you know, when I got on the fire, I wanted to be a hero. So, in your mind, you had this, you had this conception of what you're going to do and how how you're going to affect people's lives. That was that is that come is that true to you yes absolutely i thought i would be a hero <laughs> but can't save everybody and i work in one of the worst cities in the country you know memphis is what what has one of the worst crime rates in the country so you can imagine all the stuff i saw but i but i loved it well okay you you're on the ambulance you're on the engine crew you're going on these fires you're going on these runs when did it hit you that reality hit you? It wasn't all a pink cloud anymore. Gosh, I would say when I had about six six to eight years on is when it hit me. <laughs> was it a buildup of a lot of different things and finally it just came to head? Yeah, it was. Just uh, all the trauma that I saw, um, stuff involving babies. Um, our call volume is insane. So we would leave out at 7 in the morning. We wouldn't get back till 7 in the morning. Uh, I, I became really burnt out. <laughs> I I would sleep. Um, I would sleep at the fire station on my day off. So about one or two before I would leave, you know, I was too tired to drive home. Um, yeah. Uh, it consumed me. <laughs> okay. Now let's get into how'd you take care of that? How'd you deal with the darkness and stuff? What was your solution to that? <sighs> Gosh, a lot of alcohol, Adderall. That's what I turned to, to, I, I did the Adderall to stay awake. Um, I had become a mother for the second time when I was 30, 31, I wanted to be the perfect housewife and mom. And so I wouldn't go to sleep when I got off work. I would just take Adderall to stay awake and I would be up for three or four days at a time. Um, but I never slept, never talked to anybody. Um, I was married at the time. Um, when I'd have bad calls, my husband didn't want to hear anything about it. So I didn't really have anybody to turn to. And nobody at the fire station talked uh, about stuff. You know, the whole stigma around it that we don't talk about our feelings. <laughs> so I just drowned it with alcohol and Adderall. Now, at uh, your fire department, was there any kind of, I know you said you didn't talk about it, you guys didn't, but did they offer any kind of EAP or peer support or anything there? Yeah, they did. Um, it was there, but I didn't ask for it. You know, just the stigma that you got to be courageous and this is what we signed up for. And so I didn't use any of it. What was the breaking point? Oh, gosh. Uh, my breaking point was in 2016 when I got divorced. Um, I wanted the divorce. I asked for the divorce and that wasn't the issue. But I became a mother when I was 19 years old. And by the time I got divorced in 2016, my oldest daughter was 18 and my youngest was six. I'd always taken care of everybody, raising a family. And suddenly I was coming home to an empty house because of my uh, fire department shifts working 24 hours. I didn't get to see my little girl except like once every week and a half or so where I could spend a couple of days with her. But that was it. And, and my oldest daughter, she moved out and went to college and got her own place. And my dog that year died and I couldn't get another one because I was working 24 hours. Um, and that was just my downward spiral. Um, coming home to an empty house, like that's always been filled with laughter and children and family. Um, and I didn't know how to handle that. And is that what you consider rock bottom? I mean, that's a lot of stuff to go through. No, that's, that was definitely not my rock bottom, but that was just the turning point of when I really spiraled out of control. Do you mind telling me what happened with the rock bottom? Yeah. So um, I was addicted to Adderall, Phenamine, Ambien, cocaine, meth, and alcohol. Um, I started doing coke. Uh, well, I started drinking really heavy, uh, three or four bottles of Everclear a week uh, right after my divorce for about a year. I had my daughter at a party, my little girl at a party, and I got so extremely sick. And I was like, man, how can I do this in front of my child? And so I quit drinking, but I needed something to feel better. And I tried cocaine for the first time and 
that, that was all she wrote, man. I became addicted instantly. Um, started doing that. Uh, ended up with a D, my first DUI two months later in Oklahoma. Um, and my, my addiction just kept getting worse. Let's see. I, I've been to jail three times. I've uh, been to rehab three times. Um, but the la- my rock bottom was in October of 2020. I was about to lose my house. Um, I signed up for a monitoring program with the state so I could keep my license. Um, they pulled me off of work to get my treatment started. I met with a substance abuse counselor. And that night, I ended up hammered. <laughs> Um, got another, got my second DUI in Arkansas. I was going 95 miles an hour. I had downed a bottle of vodka. Um, I got slapped with all kinds of charges and went to jail for two weeks. Um, when I was in jail, um, I really surrendered and I, cause I thought I just lost everything. I, was, I thought there's no way the state's going to keep me on this monitoring program after what I just did. So I would lose my license, lose my job, lose my house. And I didn't know what I was going to do at that point. Um, but I found out that they were willing to work with me and send me to rehab. And I was like, you know, I prayed to God and said, I just can't live like this anymore. Who, who's they? They is work? Uh, my work was going to work with me and the state of Tennessee. Okay. This okay. Oh, program. perfect. Yes. Perfect. So that was my rock bottom. Um, I was ingesting, snorting, smoking, and shooting up everything and had been doing that for three years. Wow. So what steps did you take to get there yourself sober? Um, I became part of this monitoring program, uh, started working the steps, but I became pretty complacent after about a year uh, thinking, hey, I got this. This isn't so bad. You know, life seemed really good and, you know, I wasn't having any cravings and stuff. Um, but yeah, um, I started working a 12 step program and met my sponsor and, I'm part of the fellowship program now, and and I just love it. Well, I know, April, you know, we can, uh, you know, like I said, in the 90s, late late 80s and 90s, in and out of treatment center for me and and did a lot of stuff. But finally, you got, I got clean and sober, and then I had to work the steps. Well, when you got clean and sober, everything just don't stop. You know, everything don't get better. But how do you deal with life today with you got all this stuff going on? But how do you deal with life today uh, with all the stuff going on and without taking a drink or drug? Man, I've got the biggest support group, my family and my friends and my sponsor and the people in the program. Uh, they help me get by because, you know, I've had several things go on in the last couple of months that um, could have easily taken me back out. But uh, thank God for this program and my, my support group. Uh, they've helped me get through everything. And I have not even had a desire to drink or drug. Well, that's awesome. I tell you, we, we talk about the problem, and then we also we try to talk about the solution, too. But, you know, to go into it, it, there's some guy from California told me to ask you a question. He says, you do something on your day off that's kind of crazy. Could you tell uh, people about that? What I like to do on my days off? Uh, I love to chase tornadoes. <laughs> I love to. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Here it is. What did you say? <laughs> chase tornadoes. <laughs> I'm an adrenaline junkie. I, I love all storms, but you know, I'm, I'm after the tornadoes. It gives me such a rush. That K, um, I get a lot of peace in that chaos. It's it's crazy, <laughs> but I love to sit down under a good storm and and I provide. If we have towns that are hit, I provide. Um, my medical assistance and yeah, but in a perfect world, I'd love to see it just in a field. What's the biggest but, tornado you've chased? I'm just curious. I love that idea. So my biggest tornado I've chased was an EF4 in Chapman, Bennington, Kansas. It was in May of 2016. It was amazing. I saw the storm the entire time. It was on the ground for 90 minutes Damn. and I saw the whole thing in its entirety. It went 24 miles. That's a lot. And I mean, it was a beautiful storm. And it's actually my uh, cover photo on my Facebook page. That's the storm I'm breaking. But that whole week, though, was eventful. Like, it was a three-day chase. And uh, two days before that one, we had five or six tornadoes uh, hitting. It was amazing. Damn. That's crazy. 
Well, April, I tell you, I want you to meet this one guy from England. It's Pete Lewin, Newfoundlands. He does a thing, a thing for first responders where you go in a lake and you swim with the dogs, the Newfies, and there's a release with that. So it's a little bit more calming than jumping from the plane or the shark or doing the sharks. But I understand a lot of first responders, including myself, you know, when you stop drinking a drug and you're always looking for that adrenaline rush and a lot of yeah. go to the skydiving, they go to whitewater rafting, they go to all kinds of different things. Yeah. I loved what you said, though. You go in these tornadoes, but you offer assistance. That's being the service. Yeah. That's being a service to our brothers and sisters. And that's awesome. Right. I have a jump bag with medical supplies and I've participated in search and rescue. And yeah, that's what I, that's what I try to do. Cause uh, we get a bad name. A lot of people think, well, how do you like that destruction? You know, it's tearing up families' homes to death. And, and for me, it's not like that. I mean, it's just the power of the storm. But that's why I try to stop and help out and provide my assistance. You know, I, I don't wish a town to get hit. It's the same with us with fires. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you got to love fighting fire to go in and, and pull people out to safety and stuff. I mean, yeah, I, I get an adrenaline rush with storms, but I, but I do hit help out when towns are hit. I usually say, you know, it's... Oh, um, it's going to happen. I don't want it to happen to anybody in particular, but it's going to happen. I just hope I'm there when it does. Right, exactly. And most of the ones I've been on uh, have been perfect. They're out in fields or they've done very minor damage, like that big one that I made in in Kansas. Uh, I think there was some damage done to some houses, but there was no fatalities or nobody seriously injured on that one. That's good, good. Yeah. I think with all of us, you know, we like that adrenaline rush, but also we found something. I found something in recovery that, that I get an adrenaline rush now. When I can spot somebody or I hear from somebody that's struggling with alcohol, drugs, or thinking about killing themselves, I get to share my brokenness with them. And you see a light bulb, yeah. you see a light bulb come on. And when you can help turn their life around and guide them to treatment or guide them to a counselor or just be there for them, that's a bit, that's where I get my adrenaline rush today. Yeah, me too. I, do, I love it. Um, I'm very open about my journey uh, of addiction. I, I talk a lot about it on Facebook. Um, when I was in rehab for the last time, uh, one of our local news stations ran an article on me. Um, if you Google my name, you can find it. Um, I was in rehab for the last time. I was about to get out. And my dad called me to warn me that that article had come out. Uh, they ran a story on me that it actually happened a year before. That was my when I had to leave the fire department. Um, I'd done cocaine all night and went to work. And um, at work, I took Xanax and some Benadryl so I could sleep because I was going to be on the ambulance that night. <clears throat> and I fell asleep in my car. And the chief found me. Um, they sent me for a drug test. I knew instantly I was going to fail. So I went to rehab uh, right away so I could figure some things out. And, um, I came back and resigned. Um, so yeah, drugs and alcohol is what made me leave the fire department. Um, but they, yeah, they ran that article on me. And did you get any, uh, flack for that article? For lack of a better word. So I never read all the comments. I know my dad did. And, you know, there was a lot of nasty comments made, but I think there was, um, he did tell me there was a lot of people, uh, my brothers and sisters on the fire department that were sticking up for me on there. I, I never saw the comments, but I've seen the article now, but it took me a year and a half to even read that article. It takes a strong person to do what you did. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 the knowing that you're going to have some sort of repercussions in the back end of it too. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, keyboard warriors and social media right now, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. I can't do anything about that, but I applaud you for stepping up and doing that article though. Yeah. So I, I love to share my story on Facebook. You know, it was, my story was already out there for the public. Um, I talk a lot about it and I've had so many people reach out to me to tell me that I'm an inspiration and gives them hope if they're, if they are suffering or have a loved one that's suffering, my story really gives them hope. And that keeps me going strong. I, I want to keep on, you know, I want to help more people. So it's, it's an awesome feeling. What are you doing to help yourself for tomorrow? Not physically tomorrow, but the day after so on and so forth. <laughs> um, I'm key, I'm going to keep working these steps and hopefully uh, just get to talk to more people and get my story out there more. And um, so I can help those that are sick and suffering still. Um, and he said, you want to become a nurse? Yeah, I want to become a nurse. Um, I don't know what 
part I want to go into. Uh, part of me wants to do rehab, uh, be a nurse in rehab and help those other addicts. And I probably still will. Um, I think I want to do travel nursing at first for a while and then find a place to settle down. Um, but I also love the ER too. I, I still love the medical field, but I'm really burnt out on being a paramedic. Yeah, I can understand that. I think it's time, you know, I'm getting older and it's going to be time to get off a truck soon. So, April, uh, I, I hear what you say. You want to do this. You want to do that. You want to share your story. And I'm going to, I'm going to let you know, I wanted to do all that stuff. And I, and I do that stuff. Um, I get several people around me that tell me you need to slow down, skip. You need to f- relax. You need to slow down. And of course me, I can relate with a lot with you about, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do this. Sometimes for me, that's old behavior. When I get busy and do stuff, I want to help people so bad, but then my cup's, cup's empty. I don't have nothing for me. I think that's why, Jeff, that self-care is so important. Tell us some stuff that you're doing for self-care today That's that 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 you can let other people know what you're doing. Give them some suggestions. So um, at the start of the year, um, I went I started where um, I got on a diet and I started walking. I walked seven miles uh, several times a week. Um, so in the last month, I've walked like 80 and a half miles. I'm going to the gym, watching what I eat. Um, that's making me feel a lot better. Um, I love to take care of myself, get my nails done, my hair done, um, get massages and things like that. Now you're talking. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Self-care. Um, it's important. It is absolutely important, and it's it's it, is. it should be. <laughs> I'm excited to go out and buy some new clothes because I've I've lost a good bit of weight in the last month and a half. So, well, that's something that uh, I like I like doing. You know, do, getting massages. I go uh, exercise. I work out. Take walks. Uh, some of the stuff that I do too. Um, I take long. Tra- I do a little events and do long walks. Or I do something to challenge myself. I'm 57 years old but I don't feel it. I need to keep doing things though for self-care because the older I get, I can't handle things between my ears as easy as I thought I could a long time ago. So right. I still see a counselor and I still do those. Do you still, you got maintenance of a yeah. counselor and stuff? Yes. I, I do have a therapist um, that I see right now once a week. Um, also do zoom meetings um, through my 10 pat program uh, once a week. Um, but yeah, man, when I went on this program, they told me I would need to see a therapist and I went kicking and screaming. I was like, man, I don't think they can help me, but I actually love having a therapist. Um, so I think I'm going to keep her around once I'm off the program. It's been, it's, she's been really helpful. I, 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 I love hiking too. So, um, I've got a big backpack. I love going backpack hiking in the Smokies and, living out on the trail for a few days. Um, I find a lot of peace in that and a, really a good connection with my higher power out there. So I'd love to do that. Oh, as man, well. That's awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. I like that. I like how you have uh, you got a lot of dreams. There's a lot of things you want to do. I sometimes for me, I got to focus on the moment or the day because I got a lot of things that I want to do. But if I focus on the moment or the day, what can I do around me? I could, and that's what I got to do. Do you find yourself getting caught up and doing all these little things going everywhere in the world? Man, so I find it really hard for me to stay in the present. I am a future tripper, and that's one of my character defects. Um, it is definitely hard for me to stay in the day. I'm worried about tomorrow or next week or a year from now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really work for me to try to be in the day. Well, I find out for me, if I pray, med- med- here I'm a former atheist. Now I got a God in my life. Yep. I pray and meditate in the morning and through the day. Now, I'm not saying I'm a perfect person. I screw up in sobriety. Yeah. But I, it helps me through the day to stay in my moment. Do you do, you do that? Uh, I do. I do pray and meditate. Um, and I've, I've really found a lot of strength and peace um, through that to help me get through a lot of these hard times that I've gone through. Well, good. Well, let me tell you something. There's somebody that's in their, either in their car or they're, they're going down the road. They're not sure which way they're going. They're going to work. They're dreading to go to work or they're sitting in their apartment and they're alone right now. They're going through divorce or they're just lost in life and they need help. What words of encouragement would you tell them? And you got two minutes to do that. Oh, man, um, first off, uh, you're not alone. 
I know I remember feeling like I was the only person in the world um, that was going through what I was going through. Um, but you're not alone. Uh, there's help out there through therapy, uh, through a rehabilitation program. Um, I can also be reached if somebody wants to talk to me, um, reach me on Facebook or through email. Um, I would love to talk and share my story and give somebody some hope and inspiration that that they too can get to where I'm at in a happy as a ha- you know in a happy place. So well, that sounds good. I tell you. Uh, your story is amazing where you're at. I think you're, it sounds like you're in a good spot, but a lot of times for me during the day, uh, so my, my day is not going good, but there's something that a slogan or a saying that resonates in my mind. Do you have something that keeps you going that just kind of pops in your mind when you're having one of those days? Yeah. Um, the slogan that comes to my mind is um, addiction is giving up everything for one thing. Uh, recovery is giving up one thing for everything. I really like that one. Say that one more time for people. Addiction is giving up everything for one thing. Recovery is giving up one thing for everything. That's awesome, man. I like that. I like that too. Yeah. Yeah. I had to break it down, but I like that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, we're coming into the show. Jeff, is there anything that you'd like to ask or say anything for April? Don't give up where you're at, girl. I'm proud of your progress from what I've heard today. And I've spoke with you before prior to this too, though. And I'm I'm proud of your progress. Thank you. Me too. Um, Stay on course. Don't don't deviate. Absolutely not. <laughs> I've got too much to lose. <laughs> and I've gained everything. Yeah, and, and that goes, like I said, for everybody listening to this podcast. You know, if you're on this path and you've got this far, don't give up now. No. You know, you have no idea what tomorrow lies right. ahead for you. You have no idea. So stay on course, figure out what tomorrow's got, and work the next day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's wonderful to wake up now and not need a drink or a drug to get through the day. I wake up every day and I feel good. And yeah, I don't, I don't miss that lifestyle. Yeah. I don't either. <laughs> well, April, thank you for coming on to the show and, and be, sharing your heart uh, with us. And Jeff, thank you for being the co-host again. And I'd like to thank our, absolutely. and I'd like to thank our sponsors again, Turning Point Madison County Recovery First and Bridges of Hope, the Warriors program. If you want to see any, uh, see more about them, go to our website, burnoutpodcast.org, and you can see more about them. But for now, go home tonight, shut your scanners off, shut your phone off, and get some sleep. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Burnout. Burnout is brought to you by the Worldwide Peer Support. You can visit Burnout Podcast at burntoutpodcast.org or visit Worldwide Peer Support at worldwidepeersupport.org. Your host for Burnt Out is Skip O. Executive producer, Sean P. Neal. And produced by mypodcast.media.